Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Janelle Schultz. I'm with the Family Engagement Team here at ABC Head Start Society. And I have with me today Rita Wong with Alberta Health Services. She is a public health nurse who is part of the ABC uh, Head Start Health Team. And she is the one who, um, or one of a team, I should say, who goes around to all of our sites and does the health screenings on the children in our program. So if you are a parent, of a child at ABC Head Start, you, your child will have seen Rita as she comes and does um, dental screenings, hearing and vision screenings, and they uh, do height and weight and uh, just check up on everybody's health and well-being. She also is a wealth of knowledge on all things health related and um, her, her expertise is particularly important right now with um, COVID and concerns about keeping everybody healthy. So uh, thank you so much for joining us for our Monday workshop. This is uh, part of a series that we do every second Monday where we have different um, experts come in and talk to us on a variety of topics. And we are so lucky today to um, have Rita talking to us about sick kids and hand washing. So take it away, Rita. Thank you, Janelle. All right, so I'm just gonna start sharing my screen now. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Rita Wong, and as Janelle said, I'm the public health nurse from Alberta Health Services Head Start Health Team. Um, I would also like to um, just let you guys know that we do, I do have two other co-workers who also work with me as well, Don Maybe and Kara Gibson. So you may um, be in contact with them sometime throughout the school year. Um, but yeah, so we work in partnership with the Head Start programs in Edmonton and provide support to family, staff, and children with any health-related questions. Feel free to contact us at any time. You can also contact um, uh, through Janelle as well, and she can pass on your uh, concerns as well, or questions. So today um, I was asked to present on an important topic about sick kids and how to prevent the spread of illness. This is our first time presenting through an online platform, um, so we apologize in advance if we run into any technical difficulties. Um, if you have any questions uh, during this presentation, just um, again, uh, forward them to Janelle and she can forward them to us and then we can get back to you um, as well with those answers. Um, okay, so let's begin. So there is a lot to cover. Um, we will try to touch on the important points and facts in each of these sections. And if you have questions or want more information on certain topics, just um, again, just write them all out and then just send them to Janelle. Uh, the videos and poster images that we see in today's presentation will be emailed to Head Start and then um, they'll email them all out to you. So naturally we all have germs. The, there actually needs to be contact between the sick person and the well person to spread a disease. There are four main ways that diseases are spread. So one of the ways is through respiratory. Um, this involves your lungs and usually is spread through coughing, sneezing, and talking. The other method is through intestinal. So um, this is usually passed on through the fecal oral routes. So examples include going to the bathroom and not washing your hands and then making dinner uh, for your family to eat uh, with the dirty hands. The third way is uh, person to person. And this is done through direct contact with the person or contact with a personal item or surface that the infected person touched. So examples include uh, coughing into your hand and then shaking hands with someone without uh, washing your hands first. The fourth way is through bloodborne pathogens. So um, this is passed on uh, by contact with blood or bodily fluids from an infected person. So for example, like hepatitis B and C or HIV, um, and then sharing needles with the infected person. I think we can all agree that germs are not for sharing. Um, especially germs that can make us really sick, which is why hand washing is one of the first most important steps to prevent the spread. We all have a good general idea of how to wash our hands, but surprisingly, there is a certain method and procedure of washing our hands properly. 
Our children learn from us every day. So by teaching them while they're young on how to properly wash their hands and to cover their coughs, we are instilling good hygiene habits that we hope that they will continue to do as they grow up to be adults. So here is a great video recommended by Alberta Health Services on how to wash your hands. It's a great video to watch as a family and with your kids. So it's called the ABCs of hand washing. Sorry, let's try that again. <clears throat> A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my ABCs. Next time I'm choosing the next one. So in addition to that hand washing video, um, we also have a great hand washing poster as well that reinforces it. Um, and again, this is a great um, poster to go through as a family and with your kids as well. Okay. So this is a great poster because um, it's got very nice clear simple pictures and instructions so basically we want to wet our hands apply the soap and then have a really good lather and rub your hands for at least 15 to 20 seconds or as long as the abc song um, goes for rinse your hands afterwards and then dry your hands and if you're in a public washroom um, we recommend using the paper towel to turn off the faucet and also when you're leaving the washroom to use that paper towel to also open the door so you don't reinfect your hands. Okay, so, so we're gonna talk a bit about soap and the different types of soaps that are out there. So Alberta Health Services recommends using plain soap and water if it's available. Plain soap will remove the dirt and grease that attracts bad bacteria and viruses. It is the safest and cheapest method of cleaning your hands. Another benefit of using plain soap is that it doesn't lead to antimicrobial resistance, which I will explain in the next slide. So antibacterial soap. Um, antibacterial soap is not recommended for several reasons. We naturally have good bacteria on our skin that actually helps to protect our bodies from the bad bacteria. If we are always exposing our good bacteria to these antibacterial soaps, we could be getting rid of our good bacteria, making room for the bad bacteria to come in. It can also change the DNA or cells of the bacteria, causing them to become resistant to certain antibiotic medications. So this is called antimicrobial resistance. So these bacteria and viruses no longer respond to antibiotic medicines, making infections harder to treat and increases the risk of severe illness and death. It is also bad for the environment because of the ingredients that it's made of, um, because it can be harmful to the environment. And it's not any better than preventing infections than just plain soap and water. So I'm going to share a video on how to use alcohol-based hand sanitizer. 
Um, even though it looks like a hospital setting, the method that they show us can be used anywhere in any setting. seeing the video oh you're not no we're seeing your your slides <laughs> sorry <laughs> try that again try that again how about now can you see the screen the video okay let me give me a thumbs down if you can't hear it So um, I'm just going to share a couple of facts about alcohol-based hand rubs and why um, we recommend using the alcohol-based hand sanitizer over the antibacterial. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things is that um, you have to use it on clean hands only. So if there is dirt on your hands, you must try to remove it first by either wiping it with a clean cloth or just a moist towelette like baby wipes. Um, use this if you don't have access to soap and running water. You want to rub for at least 15 to 20 seconds. And you want to make sure that the um, ingredient lists 60% alcohol in order for it to be effective. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and again, it doesn't cause antibiotic resistance, so that's good because it is alcohol-based and it will kill most bacteria and viruses. However, it's not effective against germs that can cause diarrhea. So really good hand washing um, with soap and water is important for this type of bacteria. And you should not replace soap and water uh, with the alcohol-based hand sanitizer if you have soap and water accessible to you already. So like in your house, you don't actually need to use the alcohol-based hand sanitizer if you have soap and water in your house. Top 10 times to clean your hands. So um, I'm going to list off one of the top 10 times uh, to clean your hands. And I play this game with the kids at school as well. Um, a lot of them will say before we eat, when they are dirty, when we change a diaper, after blowing our nose, after we go to the bathroom, after playing with a pet, after we handle money. So that one, a lot of people don't think about um, washing their hands after we handle money. Before we handle food, after touching raw meat, and after we sneeze or cough into our hands. Because we are encouraging more hand washing and use of soap and water, sometimes we neglect the aftercare of our hands. It's important to take care of your skin because if you start experiencing dryness that can lead to your skin uh, breaking down, it could be another uh, entry point for infection. 
So use paper towels if it's available instead of hand dryers because the heat can actually dry out your skin. Pat your hands dry instead of vigorously rubbing them too hard and use hand lotion to help provide moisture back into your skin and to prevent dryness and cracking. Now that we know how to properly wash our hands, it's also a good idea to use other methods on ways to reduce the spread of germs. So we do our best to try to stay healthy and keep our kids safe and healthy, but it's not always 100% that we will always be able to avoid getting sick. But we can reduce our chances of getting sick and spreading our germs by doing some of the following. So hand washing, very important covering your coughs and sneezes and teaching your children how to do it properly. So in this poster picture here, um, teaching them to either sneeze or cough into a tissue um, or cough into their elbows, or if they do cough into their hands, reminding them to wash their hands after. And also good general cleaning. So disinfecting high touch areas and objects like doorknobs, light switches and faucets. And of course, during COVID times, wearing a mask and carrying a hand sanitizer around. So I believe we can all agree that wearing a mask is a new normal for all of us. Because of how quickly and easily COVID is spreading, it is especially important to know how to wear and take off your mask properly. So there is a great video by Dr. Dina Hinshaw on how to put on and take off your mask and a great poster from Health Canada as well that we will go through together about the do's and don'ts of wearing a mask. And again, I will provide these links to Janelle and she'll share it with all of you um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna share my video. So we're going to talk through now the steps of how to properly wear a mask. The very first thing to do is to wash your hands well and thoroughly. Make sure that you have clean hands before you put the mask on. The next thing you do, you pick the mask up with your clean hands and you put it on, putting the ear loops over your ears and then making sure that you adjust it so that it covers both your nose and your mouth so that it covers half of your face. So you can do that, you, you have to pull it up and down and make sure that the sides are snug to the sides of your face. While you're wearing the mask, it's really important to remember to not touch your face. If you touch the outside of your mask after you're touching other things in the environment, you can contaminate the mask. It's also really important to continue to not touch your eyes or to scratch your nose underneath the mask because you can introduce contamination that way too. So while you're wearing the mask, it can be a reminder, which can be a good thing, to keep your hands away from your face. When you're finished wearing the mask, the first thing you need to do before you take the mask off is clean your hands well. You can wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water, or you can use hand sanitizer. With those clean hands, you can take the mask off, and then you need to make sure what you're thinking about is that mask now has any of the germs that you might have put into it as you've been breathing. So if you've been wearing the mask for a few hours, it might be slightly damp. If it's a cloth mask, ideally you would have a bag that you can put that cloth mask into, seal it up and make sure that it goes into the laundry when you get home. If it's a disposable mask, you need to put it directly into the garbage. Make sure that you're thinking about that mask as something that could possibly be a source of infection for other people. So you need to dispose of it right away. The next thing you need to do is wash your hands again. As soon as you've finished getting rid of the mask, make sure that you're cleaning your hands because you've just touched that object that could potentially have had germs on it. And when you've finished washing your hands, then you're good to go. And you can put on a new mask. If you're wearing a cloth mask, they can get damp or moist after a few hours. So it is a good idea to change them regularly throughout the day if you are wearing a mask for the whole day. If you're wearing a disposable mask, uh, make sure that you change it if it gets uh, damp, if it gets dirty, uh, then it should be taken off and replaced again. So again, uh, it's important to remember masks are a tool and it can be helpful if you're using the right tool for the right job in the right way. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back to my slide. Um, and in addition to that video, I also wanted to share this poster on the do's and don'ts of wearing a mask. 
All right. So I'm just going to increase this a bit. So the do's. So make sure you wear a non-medical mask or face covering. Ensure that it fully covers your nose, mouth, and chin. Um, ensure that the mask is made of at least three layers, including two layers of tightly woven fabric. Replace and launder your mask if it's a reusable mask. Um, inspect the mask for tears or holes. You can wash your mask with hot soapy water and let it dry, again, if it's a reusable mask. Um, ensure the mask is clean and dry. You can, re you can store it in a reusable, or sorry, in a clean paper bag until you need to wear it again. Always wash your hands with the alcohol-based hand sanitizer before and after touching your mask. If you need to adjust your mask, always adjust using the string part. Don't directly touch the actual mask. Discard disposable masks that cannot be washed in a garbage bin after use. And again, use your ear loops to, or ties to put on the mask. Now the don'ts of ma uh, wearing a mask. Don't wear the mask with the exhalation valves or vents. Um, because th those are a source of entry points um, for the bacteria and viruses. Don't hang your mask from your neck or your ears, okay, because it defeats the purpose of protection. Don't wear it loose. So don't wear it below the nose. You need to actually have it covering the nose, the chin, and the mouth. Don't share your mask, okay? Everyone should ha always have their own mask. Don't touch the mask while you're wearing it. If you do have to, again, hand sanitize first. Don't leave your used mask within the reach of others because, um, you know, little kids, they may not know that it's, that it's a dirty mask and they might take it and wear it. Um, don't remove the mask to talk to somebody, okay? So you can talk through the mask. You don't have to actually remove the mask. And don't reuse the masks that are damp, dirty, or damaged. So again, this is from Health Canada, and it's a great poster, again, to go through as a family or with your kids. All right, so sick kids, what should I do? So in reality, kids will get sick. It is a part of life. Children will pick up more bugs when they're in school, childcare, or large playgroups. So no matter how good you, the school, or the daycare is at disinfecting and cleaning, somewhere in some time along the way, they will get sick. It's just a part of human nature um, to help our kids build up natural immunity to certain diseases. So what to do when your child has a fever? So if you suspect that your child is sick with a fever, one of the first important steps is to take their temperature with a thermometer. Some parents say that they can just feel with the touch of their hands and know that their child has a fever, but we can't always rely on just by feeling as body temperatures can fluctuate. Healthcare professionals consider a fever to be 38 degrees or 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more. So this helps healthcare professionals determine if the child needs anti-fever medications to help bring it back down. Um, and what should you do? So when children are sick, you may find that they may not eat or drink as much. It's okay if they don't have much of an appetite, but what is recommended is to try to keep your child hydrated with fluids. So you can give them water, milk, or juice to drink, but please try to avoid pop. Remove extra clothing when indoors. We don't want them to overheat if they already have a fever. You wanna give medicine to help bring down the fever, but be careful about dosage amounts. Please read the labels and directions on the bottle before giving it to your child. If you are unsure of how much to give, you can always call your doctor or talk to the pharmacist. And not many parents know this, but after giving any kind of anti-fever medicine, you want to check your child's temperature again to see if it is actually working. If it doesn't bring down their temperature one to two hours after giving it, you can always call Health Link at 811 and they will help you. So what to do? Uh, when should you call the doctor? So if you notice that the fever is lasting longer for more than 48 hours or more than two days, call your doctor. If they develop a fever and a rash together, your child is less than six months of age and has a fever, fever with convulsions or seizures, lots of crying, fussiness or confusion. If they complain of a stiff neck, so if they're old enough to complain of a stiff neck, please get them checked out. If they have any wheezing, coughing or fast breathing, trouble becoming awake or is unusually quiet. If they have diarrhea and vomiting, 
And again, if you're unsure when you should call the doctor, uh, you can either call your family doctor directly or you can also call health and get 811 for more information. Okay, so outbreak. So hearing that word outbreak can sound scary, but it's important to understand what an outbreak means in Alberta. So an outbreak is when two or more children or adults with the same category of symptoms that started within 48 hours of one another. So symptoms can include diarrhea, vomiting, fever, rash, two or more COVID positive cases in the same group. When children are sick, it's a good idea to write it down. Uh, so just record the date, the time and the symptoms. If you suspect that your child has chicken pox or measles, you can call Health Link at 811 as well to report it. So what happens when your school reports an outbreak? So public health is there to help prevent further spread of the illness in your home, school or other community setting. It's important to work with public health by providing detailed information to the questions that they ask. When your school reports an, uh, an outbreak, you will get notification from your school or childcare setting. Alberta Health Services will also send out an email or letter talking about the outbreak as well. So there'll be specific instructions and information about recommendations for testing and when it's safe to return back to school or daycare. So a lot of parents ask what symptoms and how severe do the symptoms have to be to keep my child at home? So in general, the guidelines for keeping your child at home includes symptoms of severe illness like fever, vomiting, diarrhea. If the illness prevents the child from participating in activities because they're very tired and not playing as usual. And if your child has not been eating or drinking well and needs one-to-one -one care. So please don't send your children to school if they're showing any of these symptoms. Now, Alberta Health Services has come up with a parent-friendly algorithm that can help take out some of the confusion that parents may have about whether to keep your kids at home and when they should get tested. So there are three algorithms that I will show you um, and we'll go through a couple of them together. I'll also send out the website link to Janelle so she can pass it on to parents uh, for your own personal use. But please keep in mind that the information may change from time to time. So keep checking the website for the most updated information. So we'll go through the first one here real together. There we go. Okay, so here, um, if anyone is showing, if your child has one or more of these COVID-19 symptoms, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of sense, or taste or smell, your child is legally required to isolate, okay? So a COVID-19 test is recommended and you can choose whether or not you want to have them tested or not. So if let's say you chose not to have your child tested, um, just scroll on down. And then in this section here, you'll see, you'll, there's a question that asks, have you received a phone call from AHS saying that your child is a close contact of someone who tested positive? If it is a no, then you just go into this box that says under no, your child is legally required to stay home and isolate for 10 days from the start of the symptoms or until they are gone, whichever is longer. So even if the symptoms are gone after five days, your child still needs to stay home for another five days, which totals the 10 days, um, even, if they, even if their symptoms are gone. And then here, it says household members are not required to isolate as long as they don't show any symptoms. Now, if we go back up and let's say, yes, you decide to take your child to get tested. You can book a test online or you can call Health Link at 811. You go to the test with your child. So children 14 years and under need to have their parents present in order for the test to be done. And then once you get the test done, you must wait at home until you get your test results, okay? So if let's say your child test is positive, we'll just go down to this pink box here. 
and it'll tell you what to do. So your child is legally required to stay home for 10 days at the start from the start of the symptoms or until they are gone, whichever is longer. So again, if they, after five days, no more symptoms, they still have to stay home for another five days to equal the 10 days. And here, anyone who lives in the same house must stay home for 14 days from the last exposure of when your child started showing symptoms. So mom and dads do have to stay home and brothers and sisters do have to stay home. Now, if we go back up and let's say the test comes back negative. Now here, this question is asking, have you been called by AHS to say that your child is a close contact of a person who is positive? If your answer is yes, so same rules apply, child must stay home for 14 days. However, family members don't have to as long as they don't show any symptoms. So mom and dad, you can still go to work. Um, let's say you're negative. You did not get a phone call from AHS saying that your child is a close contact. What you do is the child actually does not have to isolate, but should stay home until their symptoms are gone. So if they still have symptoms, please don't send your child to school because they're still sick with something and we don't want them bringing anything back to school. Even though they're negative for COVID, they could still be sick with something else. So this is a one algorithm. The other algorithm that I want to show you, just go back to my screen. Okay, so this one is a slightly different algorithm um, and one that kind of confuses a, a lot of parents. Um, but I'll try and make as much sense of it as possible. So if your child has one, so this, these are different categories of symptoms. So for example, if your child has one or more of these symptoms, chills, sore throat, runny nose, uh, feeling unwell or tired, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, muscle or joint aches, headache or pink eye. The first thing you should do is keep your child at home. So don't let them go to school. And then here, they've broken it up into two sections. Does your child have one of those symptoms or do they have two or more of those symptoms? So let's just go under the one symptom group. So let's just say the child has a runny nose, which probably every, a lot of kids have during this time of year. The recommendation is to wait and stay home for 24 hours. Okay, so after 24 hours, did your child develop any more symptoms. So let's say no, we'll follow the no. Then the next question is, has it improved in the past 24 hours? So sometimes kids will have a runny nose for one day and then the next day they're good. So let's say, yes, they're improved. Go all the way down in here. You have the same question. Have you been, have you been contacted by age? Just to say that your child is a close contact. Um, no, let's say you didn't get that phone call. So this is what you would do. So your child can go back to school as long as they feel well enough. And, and it has been at least 24 hours since that symptom started. Let me scroll back up. So let's say a different scenario develops. So um, let's say they have two or more symptoms. So they have, let's say a runny nose, and they've got a sore throat. Okay, so that's two symptoms. You would fall into this box here and just follow it. Even over here, let's say after 24 hours, did they develop additional symptoms um, with the runny nose? That's a yes, so it brings you back to the same box. And then on the other side, did they improve after 24 hours? Let's say no, they developed more symptoms. It brings you all back to the same box that says a COVID test is recommended. And again, you can decide if you wanna get your child tested or not, but let's say you do. So we'll go under yes. So again, book online or call HealthLink at 811. Go with, your go with your child to get the test done. And then once you get the test done, 
please stay at home until you get your results. So let's say, so if you're positive, um, again, your child must stay home for 10 days and anyone who lives in the same house must stay home for 14 days. Let's say the test came back negative. Now, same question, did you get a phone call that your child was a direct contact? No, then your child can go back to school as long as their symptoms are gone and it's been 24 hours. So let's say that um, you did get a phone call and say that, yes, my child is a direct contact, but they still tested negative. So what your child still has to do is that they still have to legally stay home for 14 days from the last day that they were in that uh, contact with that positive person. And even if your child's symptoms go away after, let's say, seven days, no more symptoms, they still have to wait the full 14 days and stay home. However, mom and dad, if you are not showing any symptoms, you are okay to go back to work. So I hope these algorithms help. Um, and again, I will send them to Janelle and you can use them for your own personal use. Um, but keep in mind, again, information does change. So just be careful. <laughs> um, and just always go refer back to the website for the most updated information. All right, so let's move on. So in the difficult, in these difficult times during COVID, it is very important to try to minimize the risk of spreading germs and sickness around. So under the recommendations of Alberta Health Services, if you or other family members are showing signs and symptoms of sickness, please stay home and call Health Link at 811 or you can refer to the parent-friendly COVID algorithms as well. Um, but yeah, basically the general guideline is if you or your child is sick or feeling unwell, just stay home. I wanted to end this presentation with a quick video to show you how far your germs can spread when you're coughing. So this is my Puff Daddy video, but it's not the Puff Daddy that some of you might be thinking of. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire, messages that forge brighter connections, and emails that get the job right, done, just have to skip the ad. This is Puff Daddy, a human patient simulator at the University of Louisville Hospital. His job is to simulate coughs so that everyone from healthcare workers to the general public can see how much our germs spread through the air when we cough. <coughs> what we're trying to do is teach the basic concept that if a patient exhales, coughs, sneezes, hums, or sings, that they are projecting these respiratory particles. The staff can actually see now how far those particles can go and where they'll land. For instance, if you cough and it lands on your hands, do you often find out people take their hands to their eyes and their mouth, their nose, and they can inoculate themselves that way? When you're actually able to see the impact of somebody um, that walks by you or you walk by them and they cough in your face, then maybe that would you know, show that. Yeah, that's yeah. not a good place so to that's be. that's the wrong place. Exactly. That you may feel like, oh, I didn't like that. You know, I felt the heat of their breath or I felt something on my face, but there's nothing for you to see. Um, whereas now there is something, there is some way to be able to demonstrate that. That white powder flying out of Puff Daddy's mouth glows under a black light. So you can get a sense of just how many particles from that cough could that end up on you. Your face, your eyes. If you'll hold your hands up, you can see the impact on your oh hands. Gosh. You know, when individuals cough, you spray out a lot of particles that uh, just because you can't see them doesn't mean that it's not there. So when we talk about a patient with tuberculosis, uh, for example, that is uh, uh, dispelling these um, part respiratory particles during a cough, the individuals that have the potential to be exposed don't necessarily need to be in direct eyesight with that person. They can be in another part of an area that is sharing the same air. Dr. Carrico gave me some tips on what to do when you do have to cough and how to keep from spreading germs to the people around you. Cover your cough, cover, you know, cough into your arm, into your elbow, um, or away from you, not directly in somebody's face. Or if you cough in your hands, then all that now is on your hands for you to touch others or touch the surfaces. For Discovery News, <coughs> I'm James Williams.
Okay, so yeah, it's just a little um, visual to see how germs are spread by through coughing. It's quite kind of scary, actually. <laughs> All right, so um, so this brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, and again, if you have any questions or concerns, um, please contact Janelle. You can email her and she can forward your questions to us and then we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, and also, um, we'll also be emailing out a survey to Janelle. And um, if you uh, do happen to watch the presentation, um, you know, it'd be great to provide some feedback to us because it is our first time and we just kind of want to know what we can improve on, um, what went well and what you guys liked about it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rita. That was really informative. I know, um, especially the coughing video, sure, yeah. that's thinking about. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. This is serious. Um, yeah. We really appreciate it. It's, it's great to um, be armed with some just really sensible, really practical knowledge. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there right now. So mm -hmm. it's great to hear, you know, from the source, from a trusted health professional. This is this is how we can uh, keep our kids healthy and keep ourselves healthy. And we sure appreciate you sharing all that information with us. So uh, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, again, please check out uh, the other Monday workshops that we have coming up. If you go to www.abcheadstart.org, look under um, family programs, you will see our calendar and all of the upcoming workshops that we have, as well as our other parenting courses and uh, our parent group. Uh, that you can can join us for. This is all online, which in some ways makes it really great, really accessible, super easy to find. In other ways, we really miss you guys. And we wish that we could have you in person, Rita. I wish we could have you in person with all of our parents, um, but that's just not the case right now. Yeah, and I wish I could be there too in person. I know, just, I know. Yeah, I always fun. have more fun when, <laughs> when uh, at parent groups with the yeah. parents there. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, thank you. And everybody have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.